1945, Americans celebrate the end of World War II, a return to normalcy, a return to peace. But it's not that simple through much of the rest of the world. In China, the war with Japan is now over, but now the civil war begins between the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese communists. This war is a savage war, in many ways just as bad as World War II. In Taiwan, there's also a series of crises that tear the island apart, crises both economic and political. Many Taiwanese living during this period, 1945 to 1950, probably felt their lives now were worse than they actually had been during World War II. One of the problems Taiwan now faced was hyperinflation. The value of the Taiwan dollar begins to plummet. When the, the Republic of China unites Taiwan to China, they don't unite the currencies because the Republic of China currency had been undergoing hyperinflation for a long time. They decided that you know, maybe they could protect the Taiwan economy from this by letting Taiwan keep its own currency. The problem now is the same government is backing both currencies. You know, it, nobody trusts this government, and in fact, the government is overprinting both currencies. The Taiwan hyperinflation, though, is slower than the Chinese hyperinflation in the mainland. Um, because of this, even though the Taiwanese currency is losing value quickly, it actually is gaining value against the Chinese currency, which is losing its value even more quickly. And there's a lot of trade going back and forth across the straits. As you know, Taiwan and China is now united. Uh, what they have to do is they peg the value of the Taiwan currency to the Chinese currency. But the Taiwanese currency keeps strengthening compared to the Chinese currency. So every few months, the peg has to be changed so the Taiwan currency can buy more of the Chinese currency than before. Now, this is a, a Taiwanese bill. Basically, this is a bill for a million dollars. Okay, this is the sort of thing you would see during this period. This is the monthly inflation tax. I'm using this to show you what happens during the Taiwan inflation as far as the value of the currency is concerned. Uh, you know, if, if a currency drops in value by 50% over the month, that's the way we define hyperinflation. You have to have at least one month a fall in the currency's value of over 50%, and then it's a, you're officially classified as you're undergoing hyperinflation. You can see, I think there's four months where Taiwan exceeds okay, this, um, this level of, of inflation. And what's happening here is if you're up there, say, 50%, that just means if you have $100 at the beginning of the month, by the end of the month, you're only going to have $50 or less. Okay, you're just going to $50 if you're, if you're at that 50 point. Now, most periods, the inflation rate is, is under that. But even with an inflation rate here with the inflation tax, tax of 10%, if you have an inflation tax of 10% every month um, for, for 12 months, over a year, your currency that year is going to lose over 30%, I'm sorry, over 70% of its value. It's going to be worth less than 30% what it was at the beginning of the year. If every year you have an inflation tax of 20%, that means your currency is losing a 20% 20 per, 20 of its value every month. At the end of the year, your currency is only going to be worth 7% what it had been worth before. Well, in Taiwan, you can see there's some ups and downs, okay, but throughout the period, all the way up until about 1950, there is a very significant inflation going on, okay. Um, particularly, say, around the period 1949, there's a big inflation as the, the nationalist Chinese government is beginning to collapse. There's also a big inflation right at the end of World War II, when everybody sees the Japanese losing, but you still have the Japanese currency in Taiwan. Well, you know, suddenly people know this currency is going to be worthless. And so, you know, everybody dumps it, and you see the, the biggest inflation spike right then. But this inflation um, going on throughout this period it basically destroys, you know, the, the Taiwan financial system. What happens to the Taiwan loan, mar loan market? Well, by the 1950s, there virtually is no loan market. Okay, there's, there's no really well-functioning loan market. Okay. Um, as far as agricultural credit is concerned, which is very important to the Taiwan economy, okay, the Taiwanese, you know, they have been doing more and more capital-intensive farming 
using more, more you know, the, the fertilizer, um, relying more and more on patties, okay, to, to make this capital intensive rice. Well, agricultural credit collapses and you don't really, you know, see much recovery until the 1960s. In the early 1950s, um, they tried to do a survey of, of credit markets in Taiwan, just the same as the Japanese had done back in 1933 and 1940. But what you get with this survey is many pages are just blank. They can't find agricultural credit. And when you find it, the, you know, the interest rates are always off the chart. You know, there's one particular category, I think it says, you know, interest rates of 20 or 25 percent or more. And all the loans virtually are in that category, okay? Usually, there just aren't any loans at all. So, really, um, the loan market is cratered. Farmers now have no way to get the sort of capital they need to, for their farms to function well. You know, all the wealth that was denominated in monetary terms is gone. If you had money in the bank, your money by 1950 is, is virtually worthless. If you had, um, you know, if you had an insurance policy, your insurance policy now is virtually worthless. Um, you know, if you had a, um, you know, had a bond, you know, or, or stock. Well, stock is a little different, but if you had a bond, okay, that bond has become worthless. Another thing, though, that happens is that debt also becomes worthless. If you were, uh, you know, somebody that owed a lot of money, then the hyperinflation does help you out. And when I look through loans um, that were given, there are loans that were given out in say 1945. Sometimes some pretty big loans. You wonder if these are people that kind of foresaw that Japan was going to lose the war and they foresaw that hyperinflation was going to come along and wipe out these debts. So you see some people do making big, you know, borrowing big sums of money at the end of the war. And then I don't know exactly what they do with this, but if they were smart enough to invest in, you know, something like urban real estate, okay, they probably would have done pretty well. Um, but, you know, currency's value is all just collapses. So if you have currency during this period, and what you want to do is you want to get rid of it as soon as, as soon as possible. So this is really just tearing up, okay, um, Taiwan's finance. Now here, this is the real five-year annual interest rate. Okay, you might want to think about this for a second. What I've done here is I've taken two sources. One is the Bank of Taiwan, and then there's also this informal market credit. And it starts the annual series for this starts in, I think, 1951. So that's kind of where I started there. Um, what you can see um, is that if this comes out, you know, and tells you, say, that, um, um, you know, maybe say you're at 10 percent. Okay. That means that if you were to put your money in the bank at that year, okay, within after five years, you would have earned... 10% interest per year on average in real terms. And that's important, the real terms. So what you're doing is it's not just, sometimes the interest rates are very high, but the inflation rate is also very high. Now, I'm going to come back to this later, okay, in the next unit. But what you notice here is there's this big hole in the middle. Okay? That's the hyperinflation hole. Anybody who put their money in the bank, say in 1942, well, by the time, you know, five years has rolled around, nice 1947, basically they don't have any money left. So their, their interest, real interest rate, you know, is maybe minus 90% or something. You know, it's very, it's very bad. Okay, it's very low. So they, they lose all their money. In 1951, the inflation is brought under control. But now there's hardly any money out there to, to lend. Also, nobody knows for how long the inflation rate will be under control. There's always the risk that next year the hyperinflation will begin again. So then you see in these informal markets, the informal credit markets, there's a spike. Okay, so, you know, suddenly you know, people are still charging these really high interest rates because they worry about hyperinflation and because there's, there's, you know, if you have money, you're probably about the only person in the area that does have money, so you have kind of a monopoly position. And then gradually... Year by year, the, the money that can be lent builds up, and people get more and more confident that the hyperinflation probably really is over. And so you see then this fall in interest rates. But informal interest rates remain pretty high during this period. You really want to be able to borrow money from formal markets. 
Okay, that's you know they're much cheaper. You get a lot more. You know you get a lot more, um, a lot, lot lo, you know, lower cost credit there. I wish I had this um, for the Japanese period. The Japanese period, I just have, you know, a couple, two or two or three data points. Okay, but generally during the Japanese period, the difference between formal and informal markets was much less. Afterward, okay, you, you find that there is in the informal markets, there's a, there's a lack of credit and interest rates are very high. Well, this is, this is kind of the dual economy, the dual finance. Okay, if you can get money from the Bank of Taiwan, you're going to get money at, you know, that, this still isn't really real good rates, but you know, it's just okay rates, you know, you can function. Okay? If you can't get money from the, the, the banks, okay, you're going to have to really pay lots and lots of money to, to get anything. So the hyperinflation really kind of wipes out Taiwan financially. Anybody that had their savings and money, the money's gone. And any sort of transactions, okay, were made much more difficult because every day or every week, you know, the, the money would be changing and losing its value. Okay, so you would, everybody was trying to get rid of the money that they did have. So hyperinflation is one reason this period is, is a really bad period for Taiwan, and it's a really hard period for the economy to function. This is also a period of unrest. Um, in particular, there's the, the 228 you know, rebellion. Okay. The Taiwanese, um, you know, when the, the Chinese come in, the Taiwanese celebrate, okay, liberation. I don't know, you know, if they were really celebrating or whether they just thought this was probably the safest thing to do to their new overlords. It's hard to tell. Probably different people were thinking different things. But after a year or so, okay, they became began to sour more and more on the Chinese government. In general, you know, the Chinese government was much more corrupt than the Japanese government. And, you know, this was because, you know, during this wartime period, um, you know, the hyperinflation had wiped out people's salaries. People that were in government or in the military, they got used to the idea that if they were going to make any money, they'd have to go and make it themselves and, you know, start squeezing the people around them. You know, unpaid people with guns are dangerous people to have as neighbors. So, you know, there's a, in 228, there's finally kind of a revolt against this corruption. And, uh, you know, the army is kind of pushed back to its bases. Um, the, they take over the, the government, okay, the Taiwanese. They set up governing councils. And then they send people to try to negotiate with the mainland government. And it seems like what the Taiwanese are after is maybe they want some sort of autonomy, like Hong Kong used to have with China, okay, where, you know, we get a little different system because, you know, we've been running our country very well and now it's not being run very well. Maybe you, 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 you put it back into our hands and, and we can run this better. Okay? You know, if it was a time of relative peace, maybe you could have negotiated something, okay, but... This is a period on the mainland where there's a violent civil war going on. And so I think on the mainland there was really never any consideration of making peace. You know, when, when areas revolted against the mainland government, well, that was, you know, they were fighting the civil war. You know, that was, that was disloyal. Okay, they were going to crush these rebellions. And so, you know, that's what they do. Okay, they, they make, a, make a show of doing a little bit of negotiation, but it's just to gain time. And then the army comes in, it lands in Taiwan, and then there's, there's controversy. Most people would agree that at least 10,000 Taiwanese were killed by the army taking over the, taking over the, the country. Okay. This includes many of the intellectuals, you know, they've taken a leadership position. You know, once the, the, you know, the Chinese have lost control and the, the Taiwanese are setting up their government, governing councils. So that the Taiwanese kind of lose a lot of the, the intellectuals and the, the more highly educated people in Taiwan. So this is a, a big blow. Suddenly, the, the Taiwan is you know, under military occupation, and you know, everybody is is worried about what's going to happen to them. Um, and many of the leaders are dead. Okay, here we get a, a picture of you know kind of the aftermath of the rebellion. So that's that really was a big blow in Taiwan that hurt the you know hurt the relationships between the new government and, and the people that are, you know, were native to the island. And then and the third important thing that happens happens in 1949. Okay? This is when 
the Chinese nationalists lose the civil war. Okay. So what are, they, what are they going to do? Chiang Kai-shek's plan, he decides to retreat to Taiwan. He also tries to hold some of the other offshore islands, though most of these are gradually given up. Now there's still um, Jinmen and Komoi, or, you know, Komoi, uh, Matsu, okay, that are that are out there that are still controlled by Taiwan. Okay. But there's refugees now pouring into Taiwan. Most of the, you know, these refugees are the people who are basically smart enough that um, they don't want to live under communist rule. Those that are rich usually can make it further than Taiwan, and so you get a lot of refugees fleeing to the United States. Um, some refugees flee to Hong Kong under British rule. Um, but um, a lot of the refugees come to Taiwan. Okay? I think this is not the richest people usually, but maybe more upper middle class sort of people, maybe many Christians okay, that, that worry what the communists will do to their churches. Okay? So these refugees come to Taiwan, also, a lot of soldiers come to Taiwan. These are soldiers sent by Chiang Kai-shek. Um, he's trying to save his army. His idea is that Taiwan is an offshore base, but sooner or later we are going to reconquer the mainland. So I need an army to do this. So he brings as many of his soldiers as he can here to Taiwan. And of course the national government comes here. Not all the people in the national government, there are some high officials that decide they would just as leave resign and maybe move to the United States. Um, but there are many officials come with Chiang Kai-shek to set up the new national government here in Taiwan. And during this period, Taiwan has kind of two governments. There's the provincial government and the national government. But of course, this new nation, I mean, not the new nation, but the Republic of China now, this nation is left with really just one province. So the national government and the provincial government are very much overlapping. So, you know, the Kamti loses, they flee here, the government flees, a lot of people flee. In general, people would estimate about 15% of the Taiwan's population now becomes mainlander. Under the Japanese, the number of Japanese in Taiwan had gradually grown, but by 1945 it was just 6%. Okay? Now, these outsiders from the mainland coming into Taiwan, um, they're 15% of the population. And you know, like the originally, like the Japanese, you know, the, the Japanese they spoke Japanese. Very few Taiwanese originally spoke Japanese, though by 1945, more and more there was more and more educated Taiwanese who could speak Japanese. Okay. Now, after 1945 or after 1949, 15% of the people in Taiwan come from the mainland. They mainly speak Mandarin Chinese. Some of them may speak other dialects, and. Um, the Taiwanese, very few of these, these people are able to speak Mandarin. So the Taiwanese have to start kind of relearning a new language so that they can understand what the government is saying. And the mainlanders that come in, some of these, as I, talk, I talked about, were people who fled the communists. They were often more kind of upper, upper middle class. Okay? They were often educated people. Um, they're kind of the new educated elite. And they're going to come in and take the place of the Japanese. On the other hand, though, there's a lot of mainlanders coming in who are just, you know, often illiterate soldiers. And they've, the, the KMT, during the, the wartime period, you know, the, the regular conscription process had long ago broken down. The way they got soldiers was often going out, surrounding a village, and then just, you know, rounding everybody up. And anybody that seemed to be close to military age was suddenly drafted into the army. Okay, so these are people that often have very little education, Maybe they're probably illiterate, often. Um, some of them really have no idea what Taiwan is. It's a, it's a, they, they don't know where they're going when they get on the ship. And so this is another group of people in Taiwan. So the mainlander is kind of split between the educated and, and kind of the uneducated. OK, what happens? How, what effect does this have on the island? Okay, this has a big effect. One of the things that I want to mention that isn't thought about quite so much is the informal urbanization that occurs. Now, the Japanese in 1946, they are taken off, the, they have to go back to Japan, they have to leave the island, but they're only 6% of the population. Still, they're a considerable part of the urban population. So there's a few years where the urban areas kind of empty out. And many of the old Japanese areas don't have many people in them. 
1949, when the mainlanders come in, there's, you know, many more mainlanders than there had been Japanese. Um, but, you know, the first place they go to is, you know, the old Japanese houses. A lot of them get kind of squatters' rights in the old Japanese houses. And even today, you often see old Japanese houses that are kind of falling down in the cities. And these are houses that, you know, pe some people have taken control of but never really got legal control of. So, um, you know, they're not willing to invest much in it. Okay, they just live in them as long as they can. Um, there's um, other places, though, where, you know, they just move into an area and take it over. And you see this through a lot of the world in the post-war period. Okay. This here is an area of, of Taiwan, or of Taipei. It's on Linsan North Road. It's um, now a park. Okay, so they've cleared all this out. But up to about 20, 25 years ago, it was still, you know, a residential area. But under the Japanese, this was a graveyard. But it was a Japanese graveyard. And when the Japanese moved out, and then suddenly the mainlanders come in, the mainlanders are desperately trying to find a place to live. Well, they decide, you know, nobody's going to protect the Japanese graveyard. So they pretty much move in and take it over. I guess some of the gravestones were actually used in the walls of the buildings. You know, they, they built their own buildings. But you can also see, it looks like a tumble-down poor place. Nobody's going to invest much in this because they never got the property rights for it. It's something that, you know, they kind of protect informally. Uh, this happens many places throughout Taiwan, okay, particularly in the cities. Now, this, this looks ugly. You know, and by the 1990s, people were complaining about this. You know, they're saying these places, you know, they're... These, these people are living there for free and they don't really own these places and they're eyesores, we should get rid of them. Maybe though during this early period, um, you know, this might not have been all bad. I mean, on the one hand, you do have to find some sort of housing for these people. Okay, so, so you know, yes, this may be unavoidable. On the other hand though, I think under the Japanese, and I think this is true for many colonies, okay, the, the Japanese idea for cities is they wanted nice cities. And I think they had pretty strong controls on the cities so that you couldn't have a lot of poor people building houses in cities. This kept cities small. And, you know, keeping the cities small and making sure that the people lived there tended to be richer, that kept most Taiwanese out in the countryside. And, you know, out in the countryside, they were mainly had to do agriculture. I think, you know, stopping the building of bigger cities you know, in the, under colonial rule, may have been important in holding down um, wages in Taiwan. Okay? If in Taiwan, the Taiwanese were gradually growing richer. The people who were growing richer, though, were usually people who had some property or had some special skills. If you look at the unskilled wage throughout the, the period in Taiwan, it stays pretty much, pretty much flat. And the, the reason is that the number of unskilled workers were growing very fast. And you know, demand for their, this type of work wasn't growing that fast. So you had, a, you had a stagnant wage. So I think when the KMT came, they kind of lost control of the cities. Okay? Before, the Japanese had strict rules, keeping the cities small and very clean and pretty. Okay? But they, they kept a lot of people out of the cities. Now you have this rush of people into the cities, the cities start growing in size, and they, they mushroom in, in ways that are not very pretty to us today. Uh, but maybe, um, you know, by, by suddenly allowing um, this urbanization, this may have in the long run helped Taiwan's economic development. So um, I kind of see the, the change from the, the quiet Japanese era city to the, to the rowdy, noisy, stinky, dirty, um, city of, you know, Taiwan in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is, is probably altogether a good thing, even though um, it, it, sometimes people complain about it. So there is this kind of new urbanization. Now, the new urbanization is mainly of mainlanders. Um, you don't see too many Taiwanese moving into urban areas during this period um, because there are so many mainlanders that have moved in and flooded the cities. So Taiwanese tend to stay in the small towns and out in the countryside. The cities, the cities become, you know, in Taipei, maybe about 40% of the city of Taipei is now mainlander. And uh, so what's left of the, the Taiwanese are mainly Taiwanese who are longtime residents of Taipei.
This is a picture of government consumption as percent of GDP. And I'm showing you this. I mean, you could. And one thing, I, I've got the Japanese Japanese data here, two red lines, and you can see these two red lines don't really match during the wartime period. Um, actually, calculating government consumption is sometimes kind of messy. Um, so you can see, I think the problem in World War II is that one of these people that count government consumption includes military spending and the other one doesn't. In Taiwan, I think a lot of the military spending tourism is a, is a secret. So I don't think military spending probably figures in this government spending in Taiwan either during this period. But what you can see happens to Taiwan is under Japanese rule, and the government consumption stays low. And peacetime government consumption in Japan, that's also pretty low. Um, but once the, the, the KMT government moves over to Taiwan, this big national government, suddenly there's a huge jump in government consumption. Okay? And this is, this is mainly salaries. Well, what's happening during this period is you're getting kind of uh, a two path, two past economic success in Taiwan. If you're in government during this period, you are probably going to be a mainlander, okay? Because mainlanders come into Taiwan. On the one hand, you know, Chinese ethnicities, you know, ethnic groups tend to be pretty clannish. People come from the mainland probably don't have a very good chance of finding jobs you know, among the Taiwanese. Okay, that's going to be very hard for them. Chiang Kai-shek feels he has a, you know, he has a responsibility toward the mainlanders. He's kind of brought over to Taiwan. So um, the government is vastly expanded with lots and lots of, you know, slots. And these slots are to give mainlanders jobs. So you have a big mainlander government located in Taiwan. Um, you know, I said there was two types of governments, the national government and the, um, the, um, the provincial government. The national government, there were rules saying that you had to have so many people kind of from each province, okay, in the government. They each had a proportion of the government because the national government in Taiwan was supposed to be the government for all the Republic of China, including the mainland. And so it had to include, you know, people from all provinces. And basically Taiwanese were restricted to just being a small percentage of the people in the national government. Um, in the provincial government, there wasn't this restriction, but even in the provincial government, probably because so few Taiwanese could speak, speak Mandarin, um, you know, there's probably, you know, as late as the 1960s, about 80% um, of, the, of the government, um, you know, the provincial government, was also mainlander. And Taiwanese were just a minority within their own provincial government. So the government is for the mainlanders to give them jobs. Also, the state-owned enterprises, which have been taken over from the Japanese. Okay. Many of these positions within, within these um, state-owned enterprises are filled by mainlanders, okay, to give them jobs. And the, you know, the um, educated people, they come in and replace the, the higher-ranked Japanese that have left. Okay, but then there's a lot of lower-level blue-collar work that you can give to the soldiers, okay, so, so they don't get unemployed. So that's the way mainlanders tend to go more into the, this formal government sector and the state-owned enterprise sector. And it becomes very important for them to be able to, to test into these jobs because there's a civil service exam. Okay? And if you want to really be successful, you've got to do pretty well at school. Taiwanese, they're kind of blocked from going into a, to government. And um, state-owned enterprises is also not a real good place for them. They tend to become, you know, if they're not farmers, probably small, medium enterprise people. Okay, the, and they're going to make their money mainly through the marketplace. They're not going to need much education. You know, they mainly need to, to be able to fit in with these business networks, okay, and to, to make money this way by, you know, buying and selling and, and setting up small factories, setting up small shops, and you know, setting up these business networks. So, the, the mainlanders and the Taiwanese, they're, they're often doing very different jobs. Um, the separation between mainlander and Taiwanese is probably not as, as great and as clear as between you know, Japanese and Taiwanese under the colonial period. But you know, there's, there's similarities. Okay? Um, there's probably more intermarriage between mainlanders and Taiwanese. Um, Japanese and Taiwanese could not intermarry until you know, wartime. And then during wartime, there were some people that, that did start intermarrying, but not many. 
and then there's the, the white terror. Okay, this is you know in Taiwan there was already the big rebellion. Many Taiwanese have decided they don't really like being part of China. On the part of the mainlanders that have come over to Taiwan, okay, many of them fled the communists and they don't want any part of that. But um, there's also people that come over to Taiwan and they don't like life in Taiwan too much. Okay, they start getting homesick and you know maybe they think life under the communists might not be that bad. So um, the government really kind of starts cracking down on this. Taiwan at this time is advertised as being free China. You know, the mainland, that's communist China. Taiwan is free China. Okay? The free, though, probably needs to be put it in quotation marks. Um, because um, Taiwan, you know, China is not really, I mean, it is, Taiwan is free in that um, there are some elections for local offices. But, um, you know, control of the national government is not negotiable. And there's no free speech. There's no free press. Um, everything is under martial law. You know, the idea here is, is that even a free country, if it's in a big war, freedoms are restricted. Okay, and there's martial law. Okay, now what the, what, they, what the government would tell you is they would say, this is free China, um, but we're, under, we're, we're fighting a cold war with the mainland. And until we win this cold war, everybody's under martial law. And they have to be loyal and they have to support the government against the enemy. Of course, this war goes on and on and on. Martial law in Taiwan doesn't end until the late 1980s. So um, this, this picture here is a picture of the political prison. Um, it's kind of, there's puns. Okay, if you hate puns, you would hate to have to live in this prison, probably for many other reasons too. It says, Taidu Ji Taidu. Okay, that means Taiwan independence is Taiwan poison. Gong Chan Ji Gong San. Okay, communism means we're all miserable together. And if you're a mainlander, and you get in trouble with the government, they're probably going to call you a communist. If you're a Taiwanese and you get in trouble with the government, they're probably going to call you a Taiwanese independence person, and you may end up shot or in prison. This is one of the kind of later on celebrations, you know, to, to talking about how they're going to recover the mainland. And, you know, the, the sign, I mean, kind of the sign on that that I've copied um, over on the side, it says, you know, until the um, that the national catastrophe will not end until the communist bandits die. Um, you know, this is, of course, the national catastrophe is the Chinese catastrophe. And the government in Taiwan considers itself the government of China. Uh, everything is put, you know, is framed as this is a Chinese problem. Okay. Though many people in Taiwan probably consider themselves mainly Taiwanese and they're, they're not so concerned about what's happening in China. So um, this is kind of the kind of giving you the setting, okay, for this new period uh, of uh, period in Taiwan's history, where the the KMT is now going to rule on um, Taiwan. And next unit, I'm going to talk about the, the first 10 or 15 years of this, um, when the you know what happens. And during this period, this is a period where Taiwan gets much aid from the United States. It's a period of, you know, in many ways, it's a successful period. The economy begins to grow again, um, but it's not a period of any sort of miracle growth. Talk about that in the next unit.